Okay, so uh, we've covered basically how to take moments, how to add up forces, how to do vector algebra, so on and so forth. Now we get to the why. So we'll be starting with the 2D equilibrium of rigid bodies. So if we want a rigid body, or well any body, <laughs> to not be moving, uh, or to be maintained at the constant velocity they're at, if it already happens to be moving, um, then uh, it needs to not be accelerating linearly or rotationally. So, uh, you know, it's a combination of it can't be moving up and down, it also can't, uh, you know, can't start spinning out of control. Even if it is staying in the same spot, if it's spinning out of control, that is still definitely not a static equilibrium. So in order to do that, uh, the conditions that allow this to be the case are for the forces on the body to uh, add up to zero and the moment about any point to also add up to zero. So again, these are our, these are based upon our vector notations. Uh, so that can be applied to two-dimensional or three-dimensional representations in a system. Uh, for two-dimensional, uh, or th here, here's an example of a two-dimensional one. Uh, so typically speaking, of course, the first thing we do is the creation of a free body diagram. So we're taking our We're taking our representative uh, diagram here and we're placing the supports with the types of forces and moments that, uh, that support uh, generates in order to resist movement or, to, or generates uh, as a result of uh, its nature. So in this case, this is a fixed support. Uh, so it would have, it would resist movement in the x direction, resist movement in the y direction, and it also resists rotation. So the types of reactions that uh, can occur, uh, we've got uh, some reactions that we don't necessarily know the line of action that they're acting upon. Uh, so uh, we've got, to say if we have a friction, frictionless pin or a hinge, it's going to have some sort of reaction. Uh, it's going to have some some combination of forces in the x or y direction. We don't necessarily know the ratio of those forces, so we don't necessarily know the direction they're acting in. Same idea with a, a rough surface. If you're trying to push, obviously, if you're trying to push into the rough into the surface, uh, then you're going to resist that completely. But it'll you also generate some friction force to resist lateral movement, and that uh, we we again don't necessarily know the ratio of those uh, forces. Although in, in the inst in some instances we might be able to know the maximum ratio of those forces. Uh, so if we have a, a surface with a particular a, a combination of a surface and an object on that surface that has a particular coefficient of friction, then uh, that basically limits the uh, uh, maximum amount of lateral force that that surface could generate in order to resist movement compared to the vertical reaction. Other ones are fixed supports, uh, so those do a combination of a force and a couple. Uh, again, uh, and, and a fixed support will be generating, uh, like in a, three, in a 3D uh, scenario, a fixed support will be generating uh, enough of a reaction uh, in order to pre prevent movement and rotation in all directions or all about. So some of the reactions that uh, can occur uh, have a known line of action. So basically you can take those and replace them uh, with a force in a particular direction. So for example, various rollers. Rollers don't uh, produce any force other than pushing upwards. So it allows you to roll a chair back and forth without necessarily resisting that movement, or at least not resisting it much, depending on how much friction there is in the bearing, so on and so forth. But, you know, that's that's uh, getting into things a bit too much. So rollers, a rocker, uh, or a rod pushing against a sur frictionless surface, if there's no friction there, it just slides around. 
So the only reaction that will occur will be a force pushing away from the surface in question. It will be perpendicular to the contact and it will uh, uh, it will only ever work away from the surface. It's never going to be you know sucking the object into the surface. Other things that can have a, sh sh a known line of action: a cable, short cable, a short link, uh, will be basically equivalent to a known line of action in the direction of that entity. Uh, a collar on a frictionless rod or frictionless pin in a slot works kind of similar to a roller except kind of kind of doubled it's basically kind of a you know if you had a, if you had a if you had something that uh, you know you had a rod that was connected to this uh, connected to this I don't know thing that had rollers on both sides and then the surface is on both sides, so it would allow it to kind of slide in and uh, slide in and out between those surfaces, but not up or down. So here we've got a known line of action that will be uh, again perpendicular perpendicular to uh, the surface or the rod or the slot, uh, but it can act in either direction. So it can. Uh, this this uh, color here will, can also apply a force in this direction or in this direction or you know come it yeah uh, also uh, you know let's uh, let's uh, let's define our axes here let's say along the rod is X perpendicular to, to the rod in this direction is Y uh, we'll also have a is oh we'll also have a z axis kind of coming out of the page and into the page. Uh, this rod would also be able to uh, prevent uh, movement in the uh, z direction as well. So not necessarily applicable for this lecture per se, but once we get to the three D stuff, uh, it'll certainly be the case. So those will be stuff that acts on a known line of action. We can replace it with a single force, and we know the direction that force is at. <clears throat> so uh, looking at this, uh, we want to we want to take this and replace it with a free body diagram. So if we were to do so, just looking at these options real quick, um, which one do you think is Best and which ones are this are actually incorrect. I'll give you a couple minutes there, or a couple seconds there. Not a couple minutes. A couple minutes is overkill. All right. Uh, so based upon these, B here is going to be the most correct. Uh, because we know the cable there, it has a particular line of action. And we know that uh, it, uh, when it, when it attaches, like when it first touches the frame here, it is exerting a force in the direction of that line, in the direction of that line of action at that particular magnitude. C is also correct, but not it's not as elegant because basically, I mean, for C, what we have here is we're also adding the tensile forces from that cord uh, as it wraps around, as it wraps around here, and as it goes in here. But those are equal and opposite. So yes, they're both exerting uh, forces on the frame. Uh, but they're exerting them, you know, in the same line of action and equal and opposite. So we can just cancel those out. Those, those, those don't. The addition of these two forces here don't affect the equilibrium of this thing at all. Uh, A is obviously wrong uh, because this 150 kilonewton force. 
that's not you know it, it it's not how the frame itself is being pulled um, the frame itself is being pulled by the combination of that 150 kilonewton force and this 150 kilonewton force and this one so the only one of those that doesn't cancel out is this one and then d uh, d is wrong because we're here d basically uh, it just shows us that we're supposed to be taking the free body diagram of the frame but if we just kind of keep this attachment here from d to f here then that's basically treating the ground <laughs> and, and everything in between here as part of the frame uh, so that uh, you know kind, kind of defeats the purpose uh, of what we're going for <clears throat> So if you have your forces that are acting in 2D, uh, so if basically if none of your forces are acting uh, in the Z plane, if none of your moments are, act, are acting about the X direction or about the, about the Y axis, uh, so it, then essentially your, your you're able to simplify things down to just taking the moment about the z-axis and just uh, and and just the sum of forces in the x and the sum of forces in the y. So we 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 have we start with six equilibrium equations and we reduce it down to just the three. So again. Uh, this moment about the z-axis here that is taken at any point. That's that. Uh, so it could be, you know, that could be the moment taken about a. That could be the moment taken about b. Could be the moment taken about c. Could be the moment taken about some arbitrary point in space here. No matter, you know, either way, it it all still uh, works such that the moments cancel to zero. So um, these are these are the th these are the three equations that you have. Uh, you cannot really aug you can't augment them with additional equations. Uh, so like you you could take moments about a and you could take moments about b and you could take moments about c. You could take moments about anywhere, but they don't necessarily give you any more information. All they do is Essentially, uh, like if we if we kind of think think to linear algebra, essentially what you're doing is you're adding equivalent lines uh, to your matrix that don't really they basically uh, you know it, it basically like if you're trying to solve solve for the system using those uh, line using uh, that matrix, those lines will eventually just give you zero equals zero equals zero equals zero. Equals zero. Or zero plus zero plus zero equals zero. And, you know, the, everything everything cancels out there. It doesn't give you any more additional information because we don't have any additional independent equations. So you can't augment them with them. Uh, you can replace uh, some of them with a moment about a different point. So like you, you could solve for the system by taking the sum of the forces in the y direction and taking the moments about two different points. That that would do the trick. So, uh, but for a bit of an example, if we have a 1,200-pound tractor and we're using it to lift 900 pounds of gravel, uh, they're asking us here to determine the reaction each of the two rear wheels and two front wheels. So the simplest way to do this is, you know, treat it as a 2D system. Um, so essentially. Uh, we create our free body diagram. So we've got this uh, we've got this represented system here, and we can apply the equilibrium conditions as needed. So, looking at these, uh, the question of which would work best for a free body diagram uh, for this system. Well. Uh, I mean, the direction of the 
Uh, weight is known, that's going to be downwards. The direction of gravity is known, it's going to be downwards. The reaction from the ground on the wheels, we know that that's always going to be upward. So this is the best solution because it has all the reactions. All the forces are on the diagram pointed in the direction they should be. That having been said, all of these are valid because basically what this means is that when you go to solve uh, for, if you, if you use, say, this diagram here to solve for the reactions at A and the reactions at B, you'll just get a negative number. So you get a negative number which tells you, oh, hey, that force I tried to solve for, uh, I got a value for it. It's negative. So that just means, all right, I had it in the wrong direction. So you, you, can, you, can, you don't necessarily need to have your forces oriented the right way from the start each time. You can fix it up after the fact. But, you know, it's, it's always best to... Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's always best to, to, to try to orient it to, on the diagram the way it should be. You, you know, you're, you're never going to get the ground clutching onto the wheel in order to hold it down. That just, you know, it doesn't happen. So let's look at a different scenario. Uh, if we got this much, if, if we're uh, trying to solve for basically how much gravel we could carry before this thing tips over. So we're not really looking at 900 pounds here. We're looking for some unknown weight. And that'll be counterbalanced by the, by the gravity and some sort of reactions at the wheels. So what sort of free body diagram would we, be, would we have in that scenario? Well, we'd have something like this, because at the point when it starts to tip over, essentially the reaction force at the back wheel, it's going to be zero. So you keep loading, you keep loading on the weight, and you'll get more and more force shifted forward, and you'll get less and less force uh, of a reaction at the wheel. So you can start off with something big, and it'll get smaller and then it'll get smaller and so on and so forth. And eventually it's going to hit zero. And then once, if you load anything more on top of that, well, like I said, the ground is not going to grab your wheel and try to pull you down. So if you keep, so if you load it past the point where this force is zero, then essentially we're in a situation where we don't have an equilibrium condition anymore. We're no longer in equilibrium because there is going to be a net resultant moment that will cause this thing to rotate counterclock sorry to rotate clockwise and then tip over and so on and so forth. I did something similar with a forklift once. Um, yeah, hell why not? Story time. So I was working at, at I was working in a lumber yard and we had these big concrete blocks that we, uh, we used to crush down the garbage uh, so that, you know, the, they didn't need to come and pick it up as often. Uh, so, you know, I took my forklift, uh, I, you know, loaded, loaded, up the, loaded up the block, lifted, lifted it up, went, to, went, dropped it in the garbage, lifted it back up again, and I was backing up, and I still had the load hoisted in the air. And as I was backing up, I guess I hit a bit of an incline. So the back of my forklift, the back forklift wheel was basically tilted up a bit relative to the front one. So I had my load, so I was already fairly front heavy, uh, fairly top heavy because I had the load hoisted. I didn't lower it before backing up. And then I started to tip forward a little bit due to, due to the slope. And, well, that was enough. And then I just started tipping forward and went like that until my, you know, the, the forks dug into the, dug into the paving, uh, in, into the pavement, took a good gouge out of them. And then a couple of the other guys had to, uh, 
had to come and uh, rescue me by uh, using their forklifts to tip me back up. I don't think anyone ever told the boss what happened. Probably should have, but anyways. So, the fun the fun summer jobs that uh, people who aren't cadets and have to pay for their school themselves get to do. Anyways. So, um... There's also this concept called uh, statically indeterminate reactions. Uh, so basically, uh, this means that we can't use the tech can't use the techniques of uh, just solving for those using those equations that we talked about in order to figure out what's going on. If we have more unknowns than equations, then uh, we can't, we can't necessarily, we, we've only got three equations, we've got four unknowns. From your math, you, you should know that, you know, that doesn't work. All these loads, we can have as many loads as we want, as long as they're known loads. We can apply as many forces, and we bas and you just basically add up the combined reactions of those. Uh, you, can have as you can apply as many forces as you want, you just can't have unknowns. So reactions, Generally, like the reactions at pins or at the supports, or say, you know, if there's a if there's a rope that's holding it on here, so on and so forth. There's also a situation when you have fewer unknowns than equations, but you're only partially constrained. So you've got some you got you got a pair of rollers right here. You have a pair of rollers. Those rollers are designed to only apply a reaction in the vertical direction. So when you apply a force this way, you're not static, you're, you're not in static equilibrium anymore because as soon as you apply a force that way, this thing is gonna start shooting off and accelerating in this direction uncontrollably, which is the opposite of the being in static equilibrium. And then we've also got equal unknowns and equations but again, still partially constrained. Uh, so, you know, just 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 because we add an extra an extra roller in here doesn't mean <laughs> that the situation is any better. You're still going to be shooting off in the space, or you know, roll. You're, you're still going to have your frame rolling down the street, and nothing's going to be able to stop it. So, uh, you know, if we, if you want to be analyzing the uh, your uh, you have to be analyzing your structures using the equations we've already talked about. Uh, you need to, you need to be constrained properly, and uh, you need to have fewer unknowns and equations. So uh, let's go for a quick example. So we got a fixed a fixed crane with this mass. And it's going to be used to lift a crate. The crane is held in place by a pin at A and a rocker at B. So the rocker, again, is just designed to provide a force, uh, a normal force to the wall. It's not designed to provide any uh, constraint in the vertical direction. If anyone's asking why why you would design something like this, well, to be honest, you you probably won't. But uh, this makes it uh, statically determinant, so that uh, we can uh, teach it to undergrads, and then later on, people who design actual cranes will uh, do more complex uh, problem solving in order to figure out uh, what they need to do in order to keep this weight above it, uh, keep this weight in the air. So let's, uh, let's have a look at that. Okay, so first things first, we are going to sketch a quick free body diagram. Uh, let's, let's start over here, actually. So we've got the top of our crane. All right, so on and so 
so forth. Okay, so we got our crane, the body of our crane here. So the forces that are going to be applied to it, we have a downward force right here. That downward force is holding up a 2400 kilogram uh, weight, uh, or sorry, mass, a 2400, uh, 2400 kilogram mass, I guess a 24 megagram, <laughs> sorry, a, a 2.4 megagram mass. So the weights there is going to be that um, that uh, that many kilograms times g, 9.81 meters per second squared. So that will give us 23.5 kilonewtons. All right, we've got our reaction at B. So looking at our little diagram there, we see that that's a rocker. So we know that it is going to only have a reaction in the x direction. I guess I should uh, I'll define my axes here too. X, Y. So it's going to have a reaction in the x direction. Uh, let's call that let's call that B X. And then we've got a force, oh, we've got a reaction at A here. So A is a pin joint, so you're able to freely rotate uh, around A. So the only reactions here that we see are going to be a reaction, a reaction force in the X direction, we'll call that AX, and a reaction force in the Y direction. Let's call that a Y. So first off, how do we go about solving this sucker? Well, uh, I think the easiest one to do here would be to solve for a Y. We can solve for a Y. by taking this taking the sum of the forces in the y direction and having that equal to zero. So we just add those things up. Zero is equal to a y. I've drawn a y as positive, so that'll be positive sign here, minus twenty three point five kilonewtons. Now yeah, and that's it. So There you go, problem solved. AOI is 23.5 kilonewtons. Oh, I have just a second. Let me, uh, let me shift that over a little bit. Okay, 23.5 kilonewtons. <coughs> So, uh, what is the next thing that we could solve for? Um, we do not, we don't, we, 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 we certainly could take the uh, sum of the forces in the x direction at this point, but that would just mean that we'd solve for bx is equal to negative b, uh, sorry, uh, ax. Uh, so, all right, let's do that. Let's do that. Well, well, that's still that's still information. It's useful, and we'll plug it in later. Some of the forces in the x direction is equal to zero. Zero is equal to bx plus ax. Therefore, ax is equal to negative bx. Simple enough. So. Um, 
Well, we're we're stuck. We've solved all we can with just summing the forces. So now we got to take a moment. So let's let's go ahead and do that. Uh, picking a point to take a moment about. Um, let's pick A. So that just means that when we, when we take our moment, ax and ay don't show up in the equation uh, because the the line of action for both those passes at that point. Uh, so instead, we get the <coughs> instead we get the we, we get the moments from the. Uh, wait, and we get the moment from the reaction at B. So if we have the, if we take the moment about uh, about A based on the weight, we've got a positive displacement in the X direction, and we have a negative force in the Y direction, so that'll be a negative moment. And the magnitude of that will be 23.5 kilonewtons times, oh, we got six meters between there. So again, we're, we're using the six meters because it's the perpendicular distance that matters. And the uh, moment for the B from here to here, that's going to be causing a counterclockwise rotation as compared to this one here, which is causing a, a clockwise rotation. So that'll be a, posi uh, a positive moment caused by B. So plus BX times the vertical distance between the two which is five meters. So this might be confusing a few of you. You might be thinking to yourselves, okay, so we had a positive displacement crossed with a negative uh, force, and that resulted in a negative moment uh, for this one. But this one, ended up, we ended up having a negative displacement and a positive uh, uh, force, well this is a negative and a positive, and that resulted in a negative, but this one is a negative and a positive, and it results in a positive. How does that work? Okay, you gotta, you gotta keep in mind that when we're taking our cross product here, uh, you are doing our R cross F, here, let's Doing our R cross F here. The fact of the matter is that in this instance, uh, we're switching up the orientations of both of the forces and the displacements, so that that kind of that will have an effect upon what the what the sign of, of what we get is going to be so we'll take we'll do this for the first one here so the R here uh, that is just a positive uh, six force uh, sorry six meter displacement in the X direction so six meters six meters and I'm just you know, zero zero zero. And the force that we have, that is a negative 23.5 kilonewton in the J direction, or in the, neg in the negative J direction. So of these, uh, this one is the only one that has a non-zero uh, result. Uh, so the only moment caused by that is just your 6 cross negative 23.5 and this this one's slanted forward so we keep it uh, we keep it in the same sign as the result of these two so 
Neg the positive plus a negative stays negative. We go to the reaction for the at B. Okay. Again, R cross F, I, J, K, I, J. So our displacement here from A to B, that's negative five meters in the J. So got zero here, zero here, zero here, negative five, negative five. And our force, Bx here, that is oriented in the positive I direction. So Bx, zero, zero, Bx, zero. So the when we do our, when we do our slanty, uh, our slanty multiplication, this is the only one with a non-zero entity. But because it's slanting backwards, we switch the signs. So what started out as a negative 5 times Bx, once we switch it, turns into positive. So that, st that there is positive because it is causing rotation in the counterclockwise direction, as opposed to this one, which is counter causing rotation in the clockwise direction. So anyways, um, moment about A, uh, backtrack a, a fair bit, Mo the moment about A is equal to zero. Uh, so uh, then we can solve for Bx fairly simply. We add this term to the other side of the equation. Six times 23.5 kilonewton meters is equal to five meters Bx. Divide by five meters. And that gives you what your bx is. So 23.5 times 6 divided by 5, that'll be 28.2 kilonewtons. So there we have our bx. So what's the next thing we can solve for? Well, we, we already used our force in the x-direction uh, equation, so we know that ax is equal to negative bx. So ax is equal to negative 28.2 kilonewtons. Now, again, it shouldn't be too, too surprising that that, 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 uh, that is, ends up negative, because you know when I originally drew them, I threw them both in the positive x-direction. That can never be the case, right? Because uh, un because they were the only forces in the x direction, so obviously one of them needs to be negative, or both of them have to be zero, which is not the case here because they were needed to resist the moment. So uh, that allows us to give our reactions. I can just redraw the free body diagram real quick. 23.5 kilonewtons, 28.2 kilonewtons, 28.2 kilonewtons, and 23.5 kilonewtons. And it's going to be the Here. And that's that's all we got. So next example we're going to do, well, we've seen this one already, but uh, so we're going to go solve it. Uh, we've got this uh, frame uh, supporting the roof of a small building. So uh, here they're representing the weight on the roof as kind of as a, a number of discrete forces equally spaced. Uh, so it's a uh, it's got a frame. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, someone decided to uh, 
attach a cable that kind of holds that roof up. Not necessarily sure that's the uh, best way to go about things, but it's what they did. So, so first things first, let's draw ourselves a pre body diagram. So we got it. Got this post in the center. And uh, so there is a reaction. Uh, this is a fixed end here at E. So it is going to have a number of reactions. It is going to have a force. Uh, a force in the Y direction. Let's call that EY. It's going to have a force in the X direction. Uh, let's call that EX. And it is also going to have be exerting a moment. So let's call that ME. So uh, we also have uh, put these red for my external loads. So we've got this 150 kilonewton force. Uh, so we could leave it like that or we could break it up into its components. I think it's easiest to break it up into its components. So let's let's just see what that's going to be. So uh, ge uh, geometry of that triangle there, that's actually a 3-4-5 triangle. Uh, those pop up a lot in stuff like this because, well, it makes the math easy. So uh, 4.5, six meters total, and six meters total here. The one, the the 2.25 uh, uh, plus 3.75 is six meters. So that's really just three times 1.5, four times 1.5, which makes this five times 1.5. So basically, that just means that the ratio of the uh, 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 the, com the components uh, here is the same. Uh, so we can go ahead and erase the 150 kilonewtons there and I'm going to replace that. So this one that'll be 3 over 5 times 150. So that'll be 90 kilonewtons. And the Y component, that's going to be 4 over 5 times 150. That'll be 120 newtons. So we got that. We also have our span here. Okay, we've got our span here, and we have a number of 20 kilonewton forces. Now, the good thing about these is that they're equal, and they're acting in the same direction. So that means that what we can actually do is we can kind of just take those and replace them with a... A uh, larger force that is has an equivalent direction and is acting directly in the middle of them, because that would basically mean that if we replace that with, uh, so those are all 20 kilonewtons. If we replace this with an 80 kilonewton force acting directly in the middle here of these, then it'll have the same downward. It'll it'll have the same. Uh, 
downward force and also the moment uh, contra take, taken about this point the moments uh, of these cancel out so basically that, that's saying that this one single force is an equivalent force couple system to these four forces combined so uh, if you really want to you can do the math on that but uh, I'm going to go ahead and just on this diagram replace that with uh, a single force acting in the middle of that grouping. So the location of that, uh, so the, uh, the first force, so I'm going to do that. All right, so the first force was 1.8 meters away. Second force, second force was another 1.8 meters, and then this distance from here to here, that'll be 0.9 meters. So we're looking at uh, 4.5 4, 4 meters uh, total from uh, the uh, frame here to where basically the resultant of those four forces uh, act, is acting. So, um, well, let's see here. Uh, now we need to solve for our reaction. So let's uh, start with a simple one. The sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero. That means that EY minus 120, sorry, 20 kilonewtons, not 120 newtons, minus 120 minus 80, uh, kilonewtons is equal to zero. I'll just write that out. EY minus 80 kilonewtons minus 120 kilonewtons. So I think it's pretty simple there to solve for what an EY is. EY is going to be equal to 200 kilonewtons. So that is pushing upwards had the right sign can, there. All right, how about our EX? Uh, so that one's even simpler to solve for. So the sum, the sum of the forces in the X direction is equal to zero. Therefore, zero is equal to EX. What's the only other force we have here? Well, it is a positive, it is a 90 kilonewton force in the positive x direction. Plus 90 kilonewtons. Therefore, EX is equal to negative 90 kilonewtons. So we're actually looking at a force going that way. And uh, since this is a fixed post, uh, we are also going to have a uh, moment reaction there. So the easiest way to go about doing that would probably be to just take the sum of the moment about uh, E there. And then we can uh, solve for And here it's sum of the moment at E. We use at E here to distinguish from the fact that we have an ME. Then we got uh, that, that moment there. EX, EY don't cause any moment there. Neither does the 120 kilonewton, because again, it's acting in the same line of action uh, there. So we got the 90 kilonewton one, uh, and we have the six meters in the vertical direction. So we can see that that uh, particular one there is going to be a uh, causing a rotation when taken about E, uh, 
when taken to put E, it's going to be causing a rotation in the uh, cl clockwise direction. So it'll be negative. Uh, so it'll be minus our 6 meters crossed with our 90 kilonewtons. And again, the directionality of it uh, works uh, based upon the whole cross product thing that we saw going on uh, in the previous example. It's the same, uh, same directionality, same uh, vertical displacement. And uh, the other one that we have, uh, we have the uh, 80 kilonewton uh, force and that is acting with a uh, displacement of uh, 4.5 meters. So we can go ahead and add that. So again, I've taken about E, that one's going to be causing a counterclockwise rotation instead, so that'll be a positive. Plus 80 kilonewtons times 4.5 meters. So all that needs to be equal to zero for us to be in equilibrium. So we can solve for ME just by moving this stuff over to the other side. So ME is going to be negative 80 kilonewtons times 4.5 meters plus 90 kilonewtons times 6 meters. So that works out to be 180 kilonewton meters. Which means here that uh, I properly guessed the directionality of the uh, uh, reaction in question. Generally speaking, when I have an unknown reaction, uh, I u and I and I can't get a decent guess as to their direction. I'm just always going to label it in the positive direction. So again, uh, I guessed that that would be a positive reaction, a positive moment there, aka a counterclockwise moment, and it turns out I'm correct. So uh, there we have it. We've got our uh, we've got our, our forces, our reaction in the x, y uh, directions uh, for forces, and we have our moment reaction. So we have solved for our equilibrium condition reactions for that uh, support structure. So the next thing we'll be doing is getting into 3D, which of course I'm sure you can tell is a bit more complicated, but uh, uh, it is what it is.